Glad to see so many here this morning. I believe we have some guests, so if you are a guest, we'd ask that you sign our guest book out in the narthex. We welcome you to our service this morning. Welcome to worship, celebrating all the cool stuff God does in our lives. Amen. Uh, Monday, October 12th is Columbus Day. Also, it says Indigenous Peoples Day. Tuesday, October 13th, 7 p.m. is consistory meeting. Wednesday, the 14th, would be uh, 6 p.m. choir practice. Friday, the 16th, 7, 10 p.m. is tag, I believe. Where's Mark? He's out back. I believe this weekend, or this week, is their hayride. Okay. From our pastors, a heartfelt thanks and the pastoral staff for the generous pastor appreciation gifts. We three agree how fortunate we are to serve God amongst such faithful members of the
the body of Christ. And as I said last week, I think we can consider ourselves very lucky to have uh, three pastors in our church, two of which grew up right here in this church. Another successful soup night, kitchen, uh, yeah, soup kitchen, October 6th. Other staples were uh, distributed as well. They were course, Meals ran out at 90. And let's see. Hard work to prepare this great outreach to the community and our church family. Thank you, Jane, for working on that and keeping that moving. What's that? He said, Blessings in God and team effort. Well, it looked like the crowd was moving in and out pretty good the other night. Our entire service is being live streamed. Camera right here in the middle of the, the room. And uh, you do not need to have Facebook to watch this. If you do have it, you can watch it on that. But you can go to ChristChurchMcKeensburg.org for links and instructions. And if uh, you have any problems with that, talk to Mark or Jonathan, Pastor Sonny. One of them can keep you moving on that. Pre-order pies. Don't forget to pre-order your pies. All orders must be in by Sunday, October 25th. Lois, you have anything you want to bring up about that? No? Okay. Notice there was no pre-order pie slips out there on the break front. Okay. Just and the chicken barbecue is coming up very quickly. Everybody should have got one of these beautiful yellow magnetic fridge magnets for your information so everything's on there you need to know even a big chicken on the back <laughs> what's that it's a magnet, not magnet not included yeah well like our refrigerator there should be plenty i believe that's all i have for this morning so any other announcements comments if not we'll continue with our service
of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Who can proclaim the mighty acts of the Lord or fully declare his praise? Blessed are they who make justice, who constantly do what is right. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people, that I may enjoy the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may share the joy of your nation and join your inheritance in giving praise. We have sinned even as our fathers did. We have done wrong and have acted wickedly. Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from the nations that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Let all the people say amen. Praise the Lord. Please be seated, but do join us in singing. Let the people say amen. Today's scripture lesson comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 1 to 14, and that is found on page 1,538 in your pew Bible. Prepare your hearts for God's holy word. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. 
He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. And the king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. May the Lord grant his blessing to the hearing and to the reading of it. Let's bow our heads as we pray together. Father God, we thank you so much that on this Columbus Day weekend that you have given us the wisdom, the strength to gather here in your presence. Lord, we are living in a world gone crazy, and we pray, Father God, that we would not go crazy with it. Lord, we pray, as the news reports last week reported that many young people will be damaged irreparably as a result of, of this lockdown and, and the stress that they are under. And we pray right now, Father God, that, that you would remind everyone that nothing is irreparable. That, Father, with you, restoration is possible. And so we pray for young people and even adults that are suffering, Father, because they, they just don't know where to turn. They don't know what tomorrow will bring. And we pray, Father God, that you'd remind them that you're already there. And that you've got everything worked out and they can just rest in your arms and know that, that things are going to be okay. And so we pray that for those, those folks, Father. We do pray, Father God, for those who are suffering because of this pandemic. And Lord, we pray that it would not be political, that it would not be emotional, that it would just be people being careful, but not people being fearful. We pray, Lord God, knowing that you are the great physician and that we can trust you and that sometimes you heal people in this life and sometimes you heal people by calling them home. But either way, Father, it's your choice and you are the one that knows best. Help us to be good with that. Father God, we, we do pray for those, Father, who are on our prayer list. We pray for Jess as she prepares to move to another base eight hours away from where she's been, Father God, a, a more dangerous place, a more remote place, and we pray for her safety and her protection. We lift up to you, Greg, Father God, and pray that his transplants would go well, and that he would recover. We pray for Harold and Paul and Luann. We lift up Joanne and Deb and Dart pray for Amanda, we pray for Pat, we pray for Barb, Bob, and Cindy. And Father, we pray for Cindy, who will be receiving this prayer show, Father God, that, that it would be significant to her and that it would remind her of your faithfulness and just how much she can trust you, Lord. And we pray that as she wraps it around her shoulders, she would feel the very arms of your son wrapping her up. We also, Father God, lift up before your throne these whom we speak out in agreement. Yes, Lord. Yes, Father. Yes, Father God. Yes, Lord God. Yes, Father. Thank you, Lord. 
Yes, Lord. Yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, Father God. We pray, Father God, for the persecuted church. We pray for those who are suffering around the world simply because they call on the name of your Son. We pray for our country. And Father God, we don't even know how to do that very well, but it says in your word that when we don't know how and what to pray, that your Holy Spirit will intercede for us with sighs that are too deep for human words, and that's what we need for our country. We pray for our leaders. We pray, Father God, that you would open the eyes of those who somehow think that all of these blessings don't come from you, and that somehow that, that if everything is changed, that the blessings will be better. How could that be, Father? Help us to appreciate what we've been given. Help us to love life. Help us to be joyful, even in the midst of pain, because we know how this turns out. We pray, Father God, for our homes. We pray for families. We pray for prodigal children. And we pray, Father God, giving your Holy Spirit permission to help us get our acts together so that we can be a good witness for you. But Father God, we pray it all as we pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray when he walked with us here on earth the first time. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. And grant us thy peace. Amen. Amen and amen. We'll continue our worship with our offering.
God, we thank you for the opportunity to give back to your use some of what you have given to us. And Lord, we know that the greater offering is our lives in service to you. And so, Lord, we, we pray that we are very thankful that you have invited us to the wedding banquet. And Lord, we pray that as you call us to, that we would invite others and that they would accept as well. We pray all this in the name of the one that we follow, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm looking out over the sanctuary this morning, and I'm not sure, I guess Mark didn't do too great with the children's messages, because I don't see hardly any children. <laughs> he scared them all away. Emily's the lone, lone uh, survivor here. So Emily, you're going to have to gloat to all your friends, because today I'm going to teach you French. <coughs> Emily, do you know any French? We. Yes. Oui. <laughs> All right, somebody's somebody's been watching. Parlez-vous. What's that? Parlez-vous. Parlez-vous. <laughs> well, the French, you've probably all seen this a lot. Uh, if you ever get an invitation to anything, it might say RSVP. And RSVP means répondez s'il vous plaît. Respond if you please. Who's seen that? Emily, have you seen that? <laughs> Emily, you're the only one here. We know, I know you can hear me, so. Just wave your hands, give me, make sure you're paying. What's that? <laughs> but anyway, we see that RSVP and uh, on the invitations, and we have to decide whether or not we're gonna go. Sometimes we have a reason we can't go, but a lot of times we might make excuses. And I'm sure Emily's never made an excuse to get out of something, a party or school or anything like that, so maybe I'll have to direct this toward the teenagers. But um, we make all kinds of excuses, whether it be we're not feeling well or we have lots of homework and studying to do and we don't uh, want to go out. Whatever the reason might be, we come up with uh, these excuses. And that's exactly what our scripture lesson talks about this morning. Uh, Jesus tells a parable about a big banquet that a king is throwing. And he invites all these people, and when the day for the banquet comes, everybody has an excuse why they're not gonna show up. And so instead, G, uh, the king sends out his servants to go and invite all the people that uh, he could find, and he ends up filling uh, the banquet hall and having this great party with all these people. And all of his friends and those he had invited originally missed out on a really great party, it sounds like. And so for each one of us, we're all invited to a great party as well. And that banquet is going to be going on and is going on in heaven. Uh, and it's waiting for each of us. We've all been called, and, but there's lots of us who make excuses why we don't want to follow Christ, why we don't want to be at that banquet. And so we have to remember to um, think about what it is that we're going to be missing out on if we don't accept that invitation and find a way to make room in our schedules to uh, be there and to uh, do all the things to prepare to get there, worshiping uh, God and loving him and trusting fully in the saving grace that he has for us. Well, let's all bow our heads and pray. Father God, we thank you that you've invited us to such a great uh, banquet and a great party that uh, is going to go on for eternity as we worship and spend uh, all that time with you. And we just pray that we can look forward with great anticipation and be ready uh, to accept that invitation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Emily, you're also the only one who gets a snack after worship, I guess, this morning. <laughs> she gets all of them, the whole, the whole pot. So. All right.
invited to some kind of a special occasion. You know, I mean, it's really awesome. Uh, you can probably think of how exciting it is, you know, the excitement that's associated with finding out, say, that you've been invited to some sort of really cool event. You know, maybe a friend's birthday party, you know, some uh, shower of someone who you really care about, or the wedding of someone that you care a lot about today. Um, care a lot about. And, and today, uh, it's, it's kind of like that, because uh, today you are invited to a wedding. Mm. Uh, you're invited to uh, a wedding, the marriage supper of the Lamb, but more immediate to, than that is um, you're invited to a wedding today, Kim and Wade's wedding, which will happen immediately after the worship service. So how cool is that? So everybody in the sanctuary this morning is getting invited to this wedding. Uh, it takes place at 1030. You're invited to stay. And uh, if you don't have a roast on, that will burn at home. And enjoy, uh, enjoy something special that the Lord's done in our presence. It's cool, right? It's just great to be invited to something really special for people that you really, really care about. Be inviting, being, being invited to things can fill you with a sense of honor, you know, and a feeling that, that you're special to, uh, to the circumstance. But since the, the late 1980s, uh, and I know uh, the men and some ladies will know this, but uh, it's been a tradition for teams uh, of the National Football League uh, who have won the Super Bowl to be invited to the White House by the president. Everybody knows that, right? Everybody knows that? Okay. Well, and most accept the invitation, uh, but some have rejected it, and they haven't thought of the high honor of the invitation, uh, and that hasn't happened uh, just in the world of football. More recently, there have been other high-profile invitations to the White House, and they're either rescinded by the president for some reason or they're rejected by the player or players for some reason who's been invited. Now, you may think that's a new thing, but you would be wrong. Uh, as far back as 1984, uh, there were uh, players from the 84 NBA champion Boston Celtics. I mean, who watches basketball unless you're Chinese anyway? I don't know. But anyway, uh, you know, if you watch basketball, uh, back then there was a guy named Larry Bird, a really famous guy, and he wouldn't go. He wouldn't go to the, to the White House, and he said, this is a quote, I love this quote, if the president wants to see me, he knows where to find me. I guess disrespect isn't new. Well, of course, uh, the rejection of uh, generous invitations uh, by people of importance, it even goes back further than 1980. Uh, and, and the reason I say that is because in a very, very real sense, God has called or invited all sorts of people throughout the millennia. Uh, and uh, so often, that invitation is also rejected. And sometimes it's rejected with a shrug, uh, sometimes it's rejected with hostility, but most times, uh, many, many times, it's rejected regardless. So this morning, we're going we're gonna to consider a passage that deals with God's gracious invitation or calling and how different people react to it. Now, the passage is the parable, the 22nd chapter of Gospel of, of, uh, of Matthew that, uh, uh, that was read this morning. Uh, now, the context surrounding this parable was very tense. Um, it follows Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. We know it as the triumphal entry. The first thing that Matthew uh, recorded that Jesus did was he entered the temple and he set things in order. We all know how that went. And, you know, he ran out the money changers, healed those who couldn't see or walk. You know, I'm thinking, you know, maybe those things should have tipped off uh, the ruling authorities, you know, maybe they should have, maybe at least they would have been, like, careful, uh, but that, that maybe Jesus might have been the long-awaited Messiah, but apparently not, uh, because the chief priests and the scribes, they didn't appreciate, of course, um, uh, what Jesus was doing and, and all of the attention he was getting, so they began to aggressively challenge him, you know, trying to knock him off his pedestal, so to speak. Well, Jesus left the city overnight. He came back the next morning. He withered a fig tree that didn't have any fruit. And he proceeded to the city, began teaching the people, where the chief priests and the elders began to really question him. This time, they questioned him about his authority. Whose authority? You know, by whose authority? Uh, who gave you this authority to talk like this? Now, that's the tense atmosphere 
okay, that, that is in our reading this morning. And in that tense atmosphere, Jesus told these men who were gathered, he told them three parables, the third of which is the one we're going to talk about this morning. Now, first, let's just recap about what we've been talking about previous weeks. The first of the parables, if you remember, involved two sons and their father. The father told the boys to do something. The first says he won't, but then later he does. The second son says that he will do it, but then he ends up not doing it. And the chief priests and the scribes are like the second son. They speak of doing God's will, but they don't do it. And then, of course, some of the tax collectors and prostitutes who were the dregs of the earth, uh, they are the ones who initially refused but ended up doing it. And uh, they're getting into the kingdom before, you know, the acceptable guys. Now, the second parable involved the farmer and the tenants. We talked about the, the, the uh, landlord and the tenants. The landlord was due rent. The tenants wouldn't pay. And in the parable, the chief priests and scribes were the tenants. God is the landlord. The vineyard is God's people, Israel. Now, when the farmers killed the landlord's son, it was a prophecy that the chiefs uh, that the, the chief priests were going to kill Jesus, the son of not just a mere landlord, but of God. Okay. Now, when the priests and the scribes realized that Jesus was talking about them, it took them a little while, but when they realized that Jesus was talking about them, the result was they wanted to kill Jesus, but they couldn't because of the crowd. Okay. And so... Jesus began his last parable about the, these religious leaders, the leaders who were very, very religious but lost. Now, we only have one Messianic Jew in our church family right now, but I am certain that we don't have any chief, priests, or scribes. If we do, please raise your hands. Okay, but what we do have is a church full of people who weekly, at least, access God's word. Each one of us is constantly being invited or called by God to trust his son, Jesus Christ. And so the question that's put to us this morning is the same question that was put to the chief priests and scribes in Matthew 22. How will you respond to God's invitation to his kingdom? He has invited you to be a part of his kingdom. How have you responded to that invitation? So let's take a look at this parable, Matthew 22, 1 through 14, to help uh, shine the, the light, to see just how, to, you know, self-check. How have we responded to this, to God's invitation to his kingdom? Begin with verse 1. Jesus set the scene. Parable surrounds an event. The event is the celebratory supper in honor of a marriage, according to verse 2. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. Okay, so the parable is meant to communicate something about the kingdom of heaven. That's the kingdom over which heaven rules. It's the kingdom that will never end into eternity. It's the kingdom where you and I are moved to when we trust Jesus Christ and are saved from being among the walking dead outside these walls. Okay. And Jesus described this kingdom as a wedding feast. Now, if you are in the millennial class, you will know how significant this is in reference to Moses giving the law, which in fact was a Jewish marriage covenant. But all throughout scripture, our relationship with God is compared as a bride to a groom. Now, note that the king has set up this celebration. In this parable, the king represents God the Father, and the son of the king represents Jesus Christ. Now you have a marriage feast. You have a king. You have a son. But who are we missing? You have a groom, but where's the bride? Well, actually, she's not mentioned in this parable because the identity of the bride is not important for Jesus' uh, purposes in telling the story. But you can bring to mind Revelation 19. That's the wedding supper of the Lamb where we're informed that the church is going to be the bride. So the bride, although not identified in this parable, is us. Those of us who have received the lamb, the son of the king. So that's the event. A celebratory marriage supper for the son put on by the king, the father. And with those details established, verse 3. He sent his servants to those who had he sent, <clears throat> excuse me, his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet 
to tell them to come. So Jesus began uh, begins this parable with the invited, those who had been invited, being invited. <laughs> now think about the implications of that. Apparently, there were people in existence who were already invited to receive Christ. They were already invited to enter the kingdom of heaven. So even though we are all being challenged in this parable with how we're going to respond to God's invitation to his kingdom, in verse 3, there were some already then whose invitation was already assumed. They already had been invited from the perspective of this parable. And in Jesus' day, these people were the nation of Israel. They were the recognized people of God. They were invited, all of them. They were called by God as his chosen people in a very special way to his kingdom. Now, Jesus, their Messiah, had finally come for them. The called were being called, if you will. So the invited were being invited, like their invitation was being stamped. Okay, in our day, we can draw this connection. Okay, the people that are meeting in this church building and many others throughout the world are now God's people. You have been invited to God's kingdom. But at the end of the verse, something disturbing went on, okay? Those who had been invited rejected the invitation. End of verse 3. But they refused to come. Now catch this. Jesus meant this to be jaw-droppingly shocking. He meant it to be. If you were carefully reading this story, a king, he's inviting these normal folks to an elaborate wedding banquet where everything would be provided to celebrate the joyful marriage of his son. What could possibly motivate someone to reject that kind of gracious invitation? And yet how many people in churches across the world are physically sitting in pews or comfy chairs but they haven't responded to God's invitation to trust his son. They've never stepped over the line. How many have refused the invitation even while they're sitting in the midst of others who are going to the kingdom? Now, you have to admit, that is some shocking stuff. And yet the Lord is so gracious because in verse 4 we can see persistence continually inviting the invited to his kingdom. Verse 4, then he sent some more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. You have to understand, in this situation, he would have also supplied clothing. And they would have been well-dressed. They would have got free stuff. They would have got an incredible swag bag. Now pay attention to how patient and kind this king is. He laid out for those who were invited all of the perks that were going to come from attending his son's wedding feast. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. And God the Father does the same thing for us. He, he shares in Scripture the blessings that come from following his son. Uh, he shows us in the lives of others, the peace that comes from, from stepping over that line and throwing in with Jesus. What awaits those who receive Christ and move into God's kingdom? I'll tell you what awaits. Well, we have eternal life. We have peace with God. We are free from deserved condemnation. Our sins are forgiven in this life and the next. We are redeemed from bondage and slavery in this life. We have a sure foundation to base our life on right now. We don't even have to wait, but we have it in the next world as well. We have all things that pertain to life and goodness. We have Christ, a friend who sticks closer than a brother and who will never forsake us. Everybody else will. They're human, but he never will. We have communion with God and fellowship with his people. We will rule and reign with Christ in the millennium. And there's coming a day when there will be no sickness, no sorrow, no death, no pain. I could go on. 
listing the blessings of God that, that, that he promises to all who respond to his call and trust his son. I mean, my goodness, can you think of anything else that you would want? God lays out for us in his word the blessings of his kingdom. And he's constantly appealing to those who are in our midst to enter his kingdom. He's appealing to you through this parable, hoping that you get the fact that this parable applies to you. How will you respond to God's gracious invitation to his kingdom? Because he's graciously calling you as well. And yet the persistence of the king to graciously invite these ones who have been invited to his kingdom is matched only <laughs> by the equal persistence of those who had been invited to resist and turn down the invitation. Wacky. Verse 5. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. So the king invites, the invited refuse, the king sends a more explicit invitation, the invited more explicitly refuse. I mean, just, I mean, I, I can't help but draw the connection. Uh, doesn't that resemble the, the response that some folks uh, who are even members of places that call themselves churches that are hostile. You know, and maybe even some among us, either now or in the past, uh, maybe some of our loved ones who we faithfully witness to, but who refuse to listen and it breaks our hearts. They hear the call, they hear the invitation, but they don't do anything about it because they think they have forever. You know, it, no, they, not, not violently necessarily, uh, but maybe just out of indifference, out of apathy, eh, you know, they've got time. I mean, they just have other things to do. You know, they're busy. Now, these people in the parable, they had farms. They had businesses to get back to. They didn't have time for a wedding banquet. I mean, who needs a wedding banquet? Such frivolity. You know, we've got work to do. That was their excuse. And in our day, you know, a churchgoer, might be so concerned with social justice that they miss the kingdom. You ever think about that? They might be so concerned about world peace that they miss the kingdom. They might be so concerned about policing the behavior of their neighbors that they miss the kingdom. Or they're preoccupied with personal comfort or just living a natural mundane life that they really have no time to receive a simple invitation because it's just a bother to throw themselves at the foot of the cross and to trust Jesus to restore them and forgive them and give them an awesome life. Well, even worse than the ambivalent refusal of some of those who were invited, there was antagonistic refusal, verse 6. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. Now remember what's happening here. This king is graciously inviting people to the son's wedding feast. I mean, this isn't, this isn't awful. And these people who are invited get to come for free. And there will be joy, and their every need will be met. And the king has been gracious in inviting these people. And he's been gracious even to respond to their initial rejection with even more grace and more patience and more explanation and, you know, and, and more of just telling them, but, you know, it's going to be good. Don't worry of just how wonderful it was going to be for them. And yet they continued to refuse. And the reasoning of that group was hard enough to understand, but somehow those who were invited got, got violent with those who were only messengers sent by the king to invite them to the point that they killed them. These poor servants. Talk about killing the messengers. I mean, messengers who were bringing the best news that could ever be brought in this life, and they killed them. Crazy. And of course, the point that Jesus was making to the chief priests and scribes was basically they were going to do the same thing. Talk about crazy. In our context, 
It's disheartening. But it shouldn't be a shock. To see the kind of antagonism that the servants of God can receive, I think we're seeing it today. Even from those who claim to be among those who have already gained access to the banquet. Even from those who consider themselves members of God's kingdom, who delight in discouraging others, or who believe they are God's policemen. You know, there's just some wackiness going on. You talk about it all the time, I hear it. But I was struck by something bizarre. You know, they have that, a, a new Supreme Court nominee. Her name's Amy Coney Barrett, mother of seven, who by all accounts, doesn't matter if you're red and blue or whatever they call you, purple. I don't know, no matter what side of the aisle you are on, this woman is well-loved. Okay, she's been an outstanding judge. She's been respected by all. You know, and she was, do you know that she was a long-term uh, court uh, clerk as, as, a, as, a, uh, as a judge for Anton, Anton, Antonin Scalia for, for years? Like, everybody loved that guy. And, and you know what I was struck by? The fact that I was struck by something because I kept hearing it. And now the timing is a factor, sure, okay. But, but the real attacks on her do you know the real attacks are not necessarily, are, are really so much the timing. The attacks on her aren't even necessarily political. The most brutal attacks I have been hearing about this woman is because she's too Christian? Because she's very Catholic? They're, that, that is her core of her being. What? Because she's she's... She's too Christian? Like, how can you even say that and people not come and drag you off of the television screen with a big hook? I mean, I don't know. Because there was a time in this country that being very Christian was required of our public servants. And now it's a liability? I was sad. I was grieved. How far? Have we fallen? And yet, it shouldn't be a surprise, even to those who persistently reject his invitation. Think of how patiently um, he, he endured uh, the persistent and violent rejection of Saul of Tarsus. Paul. I mean, he was killing Christians, and he was glad to do it. Finally, you know what? Jesus had to smack him upside the head on his way to Damascus. That's what he had to do to get his attention. Two by four with a nail on the end. That's what I used to pray the Lord to get my attention. Lord, if I'm not getting this, you need to use a two by four with a nail on the end. I prayed that. I think he used it a couple times too. I probably got marks. You know, John and I watched this show called Homestead Rescue. We love this show. We laugh sometimes, but sometimes we are very frustrated because... Sometimes they call this family, like a homesteader will call a family to come and help them with their homestead. And they come, and then these people who are named the Rainies, I think that's their last name, they tell them what they should do, and they try to do these things, and the people don't take their advice. And some of them even get ugly. And one family sued them because they said the show made them look like they didn't know what they were doing. I saw that show. They didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> I digress. Anyway, John and I look at each other and we'll be, they call them. <laughs> you know, they ask them to come. <laughs> and yet, they will be ugly and rude and nasty and not take their, I mean, there's a faith lesson in that. I believe we found it. Think of how the Lord patiently pursued you until you finally received the gracious invitation to trust Christ and be forgiven of all your sins. Think about that. And for any here who have not yet received God's invitation to his kingdom, he is still patiently inviting you. I have to ask you, what are you waiting for? You need to step over the line. You need to receive that invitation to trust his son. 
You need to receive Christ into your heart and enter his kingdom because though he is amazingly patient, he will not wait forever. And sometimes we think he will, but he won't. He's fair. At some point, the Lord needs to give those who reject his offer what it is that they really want. Just like the king in this parable, verse 7, the king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Now, the immediate fulfillment of that happened when the city of Jerusalem was burned and destroyed uh, by Rome in AD 70. But for any who hear this message and continue to reject God's invitation to the kingdom, I anticipate that God will continually, graciously call and invite you. But there is an end. Now, for those of us who faithfully witness to our loved ones, but they continually uh, reject the invitation or sometimes just think you're nuts, unfortunately, there is coming a time when time will be up for them too. God is patient, but he won't last. You know, he, he just won't wait forever. But that's how come we can't give up, whether they think we're nuts or not. None of us can afford rejecting God's invitation. None of us can act as if he is never going to take action, because he will. It is appointed to man once to die, and after that, face judgment. God is inviting you to trust his son. His son is the judge. You have to ask, have you done that? Many of us have. Many of us have. Yet statistically, somebody here today hasn't. If you have been rejecting God's invitation to trust his son, I mean, what in the world are you waiting for? Because you think the world is getting better out there? You just don't know how much longer God's patience will hold out for you. How will you respond to God's invitation to his kingdom? Will you receive it? Have you received it? Awesome. You can receive God's invitation or his wrath. There's no third choice. So may today be the day of salvation for someone who hears Jesus' message, urging us to respond today to the invitation to his wedding celebration. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father God, we are a people who procrastinate. We are a people who think we'll have forever. And sometimes, Lord, your truth crashes in and reminds us that today is the day of our salvation. And if we once responded and then just put it in, in cruise control and think we're just going to cruise into heaven someday and, and, and not be productive, Father God, we pray you'd remind us that we were saved for a reason. Not just so that we'd feel good, but so that we'd make a difference. So, Father God, we pray that you would clean up our act. That you would put our feet on lofty places. That we would have a sense of what it is you're calling us to do. And then we pray, Father, by your spirit that we do it. And for those of us who never stepped over the line, today is our day. We're throwing in with Jesus today. Lord, we pray, come and live in our hearts. It is too hard for us to go on alone. We pray in his name. Amen. Please stand for the benediction. Our benediction is taken from the book of Revelation, but before, I want to invite everyone.
Our benediction is taken from Revelation 19. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him the glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. And then the angel said to me, write this down. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Blessed are you.